two Sundays, I might be up here in sweats. You never know. I just go, go what I feel. My, uh, we, we were visiting, we were visiting Papa last night, and uh, we bought up some shirts. We had all got some shirts to wear um, at uh, the church because he lost some weight and he needed some shirts. And so I made a joke. I said, well, now you got your dress shirts. You can wear them with some shorts. And you should have saw his face. <laughs> He said, I get up, I go to church, I get dressed. That's what I do, I get dressed. And he's from that era, and I saw something. Um, I think it's Greater Travelers West Baptist Church. They were they're just now getting ready to assemble again, but they were shut down for a year. And one of their church mothers dressed up every Sunday, put on her hat for 54 weeks, and went on Zoom to have go to church. She said, this is just what I do, and I'm not going to let anything stop me from doing what I do on Sunday morning. I, I, I bless God for her, and I know some people took offense because, of, of course, you don't have to get dressed to go to church. Leave people alone. If they want to get dressed, let them get dressed. If you want to wear shorts, wear shorts. Leave everybody alone, amen? So I'm grateful. So yeah, Papa's not here, but Tata is here. Deacon Bobby, that's Tata. Yeah. Yeah. If you ever want to know who runs the church, go see him. All right, uh, he and his wife are here, and um, his wife is in the back greeting like normal. And they are uh, a few of the first that are starting to come back, um, having their vaccines done and all that kind of stuff. And listen, I don't promote vaccines, but I say that if you feel like you need to get one, go get the vaccine, okay? Amen. And so uh, we have quite a few um, that started getting vaccines last month. And within the next two to three weeks, they'll start falling, filing back through and all that kind of stuff. So we're excited just to be around family again, amen? amen. We're excited. Children can be released in the children's church. Sam Kaya is in the building. What's up, bro? Y'all better clap for Sam. Sam, Sam, raise your hand. That's Sam right there. That's why that's Sam. I haven't seen Sam in a little while. I haven't seen Sam in a little while. And um, yeah, Pastor, thank you for letting us play a little bit. We uh, yesterday at rehearsal, Saturday, yesterday at rehearsal, we said, well, when that song's in, we're gonna have some fun. And I said, well. I know the pastor. I'm going to talk to her, see if she'll let us play. I didn't have to talk to her. She let us play a little bit. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To our, our worship team musicians, God bless you again. Thank you. Thank you. This has been about, yeah, yeah. This has been about three or four weeks now, right, since we've had a transition. And, and I love the fact that God is allowing us to prepare for when everyone starts filing back through these doors, all right? So... I'm grateful of it and I'm excited about it because reset. Right. 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 Reset. reset. Right. Nothing personal, it's just reset. It's right. purposeful, amen? Right. All right. So we won't have, we rehearse on Saturdays, and me and Amatika were talking, and we're not going to rehearse next Saturday. And we both have the same idea. We're going to light up those smokers right. and sit out in front of the smokers yeah. and smoke meat all day. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you see smoke from Estrella going all the way up to Hacienda, yeah. it's not a fire emergency. We're just getting busy. That's all we're doing, right? We're just getting busy. Listen, this is Palm Sunday, and it's the Sunday leading up to Resurrection Sunday. Some people say Easter Sunday. I don't argue with you, whichever one you want to say. Sometimes I'll say Easter. Sometimes I'll say Resurrection. I do understand the pagan connotations, but if you look a little bit deeper, um, it's actually tied closely to our faith, all right? So I don't argue with anybody, whether you say Easter or Resurrection. You can say Easter, Paul, I care. I just, it just it doesn't matter to me, all right? Resurrection, with <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. But this is Palm Sunday, and this is the Sunday where after centuries of oppression of God's people, the chosen one, the Messiah, finally shows up, okay? And next week, I'm going to go through a little bit of the history um, uh, to how we got to this point to where we needed him to show up. But, but this is it. This yeah. is the week that we celebrate because on this week, he shows up. And then on this week, he enters in Jerusalem. This week, he's tried and convicted. This week, he's ridiculed. He's mocked. This week... He's, uh, he's hung on a cross where he gives us the last seven sayings. This is the week where he sheds blood for remission of our sin. This is the week where we need to be excited, right? Because this is the week where he shed, he shed blood for us. And yeah, yeah, this is the week where we celebrate Good Friday. And we, and, we, and we look at Saturday, how crazy it was. And then we celebrate the fact that early Sunday morning, he got up out of the grave. And this week is key because this is what we call Passion Week, right? And so, and so centuries and centuries of oppression. And the prophet Zechariah in chapter 9, verse 9, he says, Rejoice, he's prophesying, people of Zion. Shout and triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey. And he's riding on a donkey's colt, right? And Zechariah is prophesying, saying, look, 
the one that you're looking for, the Messiah, the Savior, he's going to come into town riding on a donkey. Now, that should show you the character of who Jesus Christ really was. He is the king of kings. He is the son of God himself. And yet still, he didn't need a Bentley to come into town. Oh, that's, 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 that should show you, right? Because some of us get a title, all of a sudden our heads get bigger than the door, right? Than the door jam, right? But he is the son of God. He is the king of kings. And he's riding into town on a lowly donkey. Now we fast forward from Zechariah into the Gospels. And Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John all cover these events from Palm Sunday. But I want to look at Matthew's uh, version, Matthew's writings. In Matthew chapter 21. Verse 1, it says, As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount Olives. Jesus sent two of them ahead, going to the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there, and its coat beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say the Lord needs them, and they will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy. Now, Zechariah prophesied that your king, your Messiah, is coming on a coat. Jesus now gets ready to enter into Jerusalem in Matthew 21, and he tells the disciples, go to the next town and find me a donkey. Jesus now rides into town on the donkey, right? Now, he's riding into town on the donkey, and the people are celebrating because they know the prophecy. They know, they know the word, and they know the word, and Zechariah said, ooh, the Messiah is coming, he's riding on the donkey. They know who he is. And so they celebrate. They say Hosanna, which means save us. They're saying save us because they're tired of being in captivity. They're tired of being in spiritual oppression. They're saying save us. And then they take palms and they throw them on the ground. Palm Sunday, right? Palm trees, Palm Sunday. And I've always argued, I've always said, wait, this is like the land of palm trees. Is it not Palm Springs, Coachella Valley, Palm Desert? Right. What, what if, what if, what if, instead of complaining about Pride Week downtown one year, we just took a week and put palms on the ground? We got plenty of palms to go around, don't we? Yeah. Instead of complaining about gang violence, why don't we just take palms and put them there? Because this is it. We ima imagine, imagine if we just came together collectively, church to church, and said, this is Passion Week. We're going to take palm tree palms down and just lay them on all the major streets of the cities. Send a message to the devil. How many of us would pay my fine? All right, thank you. All right, okay. all right. All right, so if I do it next year, I don't want to be so, okay, all right, all right. Now, Jesus comes in, and they're cheering his name. They're, they're celebrating him. And the first thing he does is, is he goes and he cleanses out the temple. Now, this isn't the first time he cleaned the temple because John chapter 2 tells of the first time he cleaned the temple. Right after he turned water into wine, he walked into the temple, and he saw that they were selling goods and services inside the temple. By services, I'm saying that there was, there was, a, uh, there was a practice going on because if you travel from around the world to come to Jerusalem and you wanted to present a, an offering at the altar, you couldn't travel with a goat. You couldn't travel with, it, with an animal. So you got to the temple. You got to Jerusalem to buy an animal to go, to the, to go sacrifice. Well, these knuckleheads decided, let's just make the house of God the place where they do their exchanges. Let's make the house of God the place where people can come in and, and buy their donkeys and buy their mules or whatever they, for sacrifice. Jesus walked into the temple and he turned tables. The Bible says, he says, you turned my father's house into a den of thieves. Not only were they selling in the temple, but they had the nerve to be overcharging in the name of Jesus. Yeah, right? And so now here it is on Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, he now, he's getting celebrated. And he goes into the temple again. And they're still doing the same old thing. Don't you dare judge these people. Because sometimes God delivers us and we go back and do the same old thing. Right, right. We go, oh, I can't believe the church people. That's us. And so Jesus walks into the temple and he flips tables again. And I told you all last year, one of the things that stood out to me was that they had the doves caged, caged inside of a cage inside the temple. And to me, the Lord showed me in prayer that the dove is representative of the Holy Spirit. Let me know that because when Jesus was baptized, it said a dove descended upon him. And from there, we understand theologically that at that particular moment, you have the Father speaking, you have the Son in water, and you have the Holy Spirit there present in the form of a dove. And so when you say that a dove was caged in the church, it lets me know that they had caged the Holy Spirit. Spirit is like the house of worship. Don't you dare judge them as I told you all a year or two ago. We've caged the Holy Spirit in worship all the time because the Holy Spirit wants to move in a particular way, but it's not conducive to our program. The Holy Spirit's trying to bring breakthrough and deliverance, but it doesn't look like what we want it to look like, and so we cage it. Jesus whooped people out of that temple. The message about Palm Sunday should let us know this. You can't really hold on to the applause of people. Because soon they're not going to be able to stand you. Within four verses, he was celebrated, then he was criticized. Criticized to the point where they're ready to condemn him and convict him and try him and put him to death. 
Isn't that something? How sometimes the very brother or sister who loved you when you walked in the church can start to despise you once you start serving the Lord. Isn't it funny how we have territorial spirits, even in church, where I love you when you get here until I find out that you do the same thing that I do. Now suddenly I want y'all yeah, But I don't want that to be the focal point of the message. Because the focal point of the message is a little bit further in Matthew 21. And it amazes me how this all happened on Palm Sunday. So he leaves the temple after tearing up stuff. He sees a fig tree, and the fig tree doesn't have fruit on it, and he curses it. He curses the fig tree because the fig tree had no fruit. He was hungry. That was the man of him. He was, half, he, was, he was man of God at the same time. And he saw a fig tree from afar, and it had no fruit on it, so he cursed it. Why did he curse it? Because the tree had leaves. And a fig tree grows leaves after the fruit is grown. So if you see leaves on a fig tree, then you can automatically assume that there has to be fruit on it because the, the leaves grow after the fig. And so Jesus saw leaves and he walked to the tree and he saw no fruit. And so he cursed it from the root, said, may you never bear fruit again. And I told you all maybe six months ago that it's amazing how some of us in the body of Christ have leaves with no fruit. What's a leaf? A title is a leaf. A position is a leaf. And no fruit. What is the fruit? Galatians 5, 22 tells us what the fruit of the Spirit is. So how is it that you can say that you love the Lord and you have this title, but you show no fruit? That's just, I'm just telling you what's in the Word. Uh, y'all y'all danced and shouted already. We good now. Okay, so we just, all right, we done worship, we done praise, we done had a good time. And now we can get the Word just pure and raw and uncut. That's what it is. And so we cursed the tree from the root. And then the disciples came by and looked at it, and they saw it the next day, and they said, wait a minute. That tree still hasn't borne any fruit. And they're inquisitive. They're saying, how in the world does that happen? This is where today's message is. Matthew 21. Let's go there. Y'all there yet? Yeah. yeah. Verse 21. I tell you the truth. If you have faith and don't doubt, you can do things like this and much more. You can even say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. You can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you will receive it. Jesus used the example of that fig tree to tell the disciples that the reason why I could curse that fig tree and did not give fruit is because I had faith in what I said. Y'all, y'all there? Imagine how your life could change if you spoke the word over your life and you actually believed it. I ask that question because many of us know scripture, but I don't know if we really believe scripture. And then, then, then we'll believe scripture as it pertains to everybody else. But when it comes to our situation, we really don't believe the scripture. Isn't it funny how we can stand boldly and declare healing over somebody else's body? But when it comes to our own body, we start to doubt that God is able. Isn't it amazing how we can declare that God can save somebody else's son from crap and from addiction and from prostitution and from gambling? But when it comes to our children, we get these passive prayers. Where is that same boldness that you had for Sister Johnson? Where is that boldness you had for Brother Leeward? Where is that boldness you had for the event? Why don't you have that same boldness for yourself? I'm here to challenge you today to have that boldness for yourself. Now, before I say we need to declare the word, first we need to know the word. You can't declare what I said. You need to declare what he said. But but Jesus Jesus said, Jesus, if you have the faith the size of this mustard seed. Now, I know we always look at the mustard seed as something so small and minuscule. But don't you dare do that to the mustard seed. The mustard seed is powerful. Because from one mustard seed can, can produce a harvest full of mustard seeds. And so he's not saying that you need to have a small amount of faith. He said you need to have faith that can grow. The scripture says we go from faith to faith. Right? Faith that can grow. What does that mean? I should not be trying to get 2021 miracles off of 1974 faith. Oh, oh, oh. oh this is why I can't depend on my grandmother's prayers anymore. I need to be praying for myself. Grandma is long and gone. She's buried. She's in glory. She's no longer at the altar for me. So now those prayers that she prayed in the 80s for me, now I need to have that kind of faith to pray for myself. Amen. Amen. This is what the enemy does, and I'll tell you how it works for me. He'll make you feel selfish for speaking the word over your own self. Anybody ever been there? Yeah, yeah. You lay out at this altar for 45 minutes to an hour to an hour and a half in your prayer closet, interceding for everybody else, say they said a word. But the moment you say, Lord, bless me, now you're selfish. Yeah. Oh, whoo. Glory. 
Listen, you better pray for yourself like you believe nobody else is. Okay. Now, now he says you can ask for anything. He says you ask his mountain to move and to be moved. So the question is one, question one, what is your mountain? What is it that's standing in your way that you want moved? What is it that hasn't been moved? See, here's the, here, here, here's the thing. I've been shouting, I've been dancing, and this mountain still has not moved. He said, because I didn't tell you to shout and dance. I told you to speak to it. I've been coming to church serving, and the mountain's still there. He says, because you have not spoken to it yet. And even if you spoke to it, you didn't really believe. But then, the second question is, he says, you can ask for anything, and my father will do it. First question is, what is it, what's your announcement? Second question is, what is it that you want? Now, understand this, because I don't believe in teaching false doctrine. This is not a blank check. Y'all got me? Yes, sir. This is not a genie in a bottle or a magic trick. Yes, sir. God's not just going to give you the thing. Now, now, now we got to be careful because we understand that we live in sin nature. Our flesh never wants the things that God wants for us. And so when we say God will give you what you want, we got to put parameters around that. Before somebody leave out of here and start asking for stuff, it ain't God. <laughs> okay, we there? We good there? Yeah. All right. So, 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 so here's a few things to consider. So I'm going to show you. I'm, I'm going to show you how to ask. But here's a few things to consider before you ask. First, is your heart changed? Oh. Jeremiah 17 and 9. I know Franklin always reminds me of the scripture that the heart is wicked and deceitful. Right. Yeah. This is why when David sinned in Psalm 51, he says, create me a clean heart. He says, because I know that that was my old fleshly nasty heart that caused me to leave my kingdom and put my whole kingdom and assignment and anointing at stake to sleep with a woman that wasn't my wife. He says, so look, God, create me a clean heart because I don't want my old wicked heart to lead me to that same thing again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you understand that when we act a fool, when we do things we ain't got no business doing, it's our heart that leads us. That's why Proverbs 4 and 23 says, guard your heart above all else, because from it is the wellspring of life. Yeah. It's your heart that will dictate the things that you will do. As a man thinketh in his heart. So Psalms 37 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. If you've been in the word of life for a while, you understand the, the context of the scripture, because we teach it often. Delight yourself in the Lord, meaning make it your pleasure to get to know him and his will for your life. And he will give you the desires of your heart. That word desires means a sign. If you delight yourself in the Lord, he will tell your heart what it should desire. That's what the scripture said. Right? This is why I need to have a clean heart. Because before I had a clean heart, I asked God for a bunch of stuff I had no business asking for. Yeah. 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 Anybody ever ask God for the bit me that you didn't have a job? No. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to paraphrase a few things, right? Right, 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 right. Can't afford the oil change of the bit me. Lord, give me the bit. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell you something real, real quick. Uh, I, told, I told the testimony how I was looking at a BMW 7 Series because I loved the car. And I loved, it was just, man, this, did you know in that car you can change the station and the CDs by waving your hand? Mm. You've got to push the wow. button. You're on the freeway driving, and you want to change the station, you ain't got to click, just do this. And just, uh, right, open the door, the lights shine on the concrete, and all that kind of stuff. And I said, oh, that's my car. Uh, set it once, and ooh, I ain't got to put the seat back. My big old self feel good in this car. <laughs> Notice that on her side, she had a button where she could have her seat ice cold and push it up, and on my side, I can have it hot and all the way back. Suffer controls, then in the back seat they had seat warmers. Oh. And the one that I saw in the back seat, you know how in the back seat you have a console in the back seat? In the back seat, the console had a mini refrigerator in it. Wow. And I said, man, Kayla on road trips, all she did was bring snacks, that's what she do, right? And I'm sitting there and I'm like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And I wasn't even thinking about the price of the car. Then I did some research. <laughs> Found out the cost of an oil change. When I found out the oil change was 239, I called, I was like, so does that go in my payment? Is that like part of it? Or is that, like, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to figure this thing out. And I, then I found out how much the tires cost. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I sat back and I said, here it is. I was asking God for something that clearly was not in his will for me. Because if it was in his will, he would have provision for me to sustain it. So I have a 2006 show to have a lot. Yeah. Oil changes are $29.95, tires are $35. And I roll that thing, okay, all right, okay. All right. Yeah. 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 
that's, that's <laughs> now because I have a clean heart, my, the desire that I, the, the things that I'm asking for is something that I can sustain, something that I can hold on to, something that I can keep and it'll keep me where I need to go. I'm no longer asking for things outside of that. Second thing is, what you're asking for does it line up with the word. God is not obligated to bless you with anything that goes against his word. Well, how do I know if I'm asking according to the word? Read it. Read it. Read it. And I guarantee you, if you read it, you'll be able to identify false teachers. Oh, yeah. I remember growing up in the 80s. There was the Name and the Claim It movement. Anybody remember that? Y'all remember that? Go to, go to the car dealership. Put your hand on the car and just claim it. And it's yours. Claim it, claim it, yeah. It's like, where's that in the word exactly? <laughs> You need a driver's license. What's she claiming? Right. But many of us are duped, and many of us are fooled, and many of us are tricked because we don't know what the word says because we just don't read it. I saw something where a prophet came to the town and charged five hundred dollars to get in the line and receive a word from the Lord. Why do I need to pay you five hundred dollars when I have fourteen Bibles in my house? The word is there. So what you're asking for is a line up with the word of God. Number three. Number three. Number three. Will it help you fulfill your purpose? Mm. All right. Now go back to go back to the previous one. Uh, will of God. First John five and fourteen. It says this: We are confident that He hears us whenever we ask Him for anything that pleases Him. And since we know He hears us when we make our request, we also know He'll give us what we ask for. He says that God will give us what we ask for if we're asking what's pleasing to Him. Mm -hmm. That's what's in His will. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Third thing is: Will it help you fulfill your purpose? Understand that everything God gives you, everything God blesses us with. It's to impact the kingdom. Amen. It's to impact the kingdom. Yes. And believe it or not, I don't care how small the gift may be, I dare you to sit back and think, well, how can I impact the kingdom with this gift? And I guarantee you, God will show you. Yes, yes, when, I, when, I, when I first got, I love video games. Well, I don't play them as much as I used to. It's not a time, but I still love video games. And when I bought the new systems, I would have you, I'm sitting back and I'm like, okay, I got these systems, but I need to be asking God, how can these systems impact the kingdom? And immediately, the next night, the next night, I'm, I'm, I'm messing around on my, uh, on my phone, and, and your phone now gives you memories. And a memory popped up as how we had a video game right here at the church. Amen. We brought a game truck out, you remember? And it was 14 kids stacked in that game truck playing video games. God saying, I gift you with things, not for you to be selfish with, but for you to have the kingdom. Some of us have gifts that we just keep to ourselves. God said, that's not what I, that's not what I gifted you for. And I always pick on people, even in the church, if you have a gift to sing, the only person that knows you should sing should not be you. You should be singing for the kingdom. Y'all yeah. hear me? Y'all yeah. hear me? No, no, no. I'm being, and I'm not just saying singing up here on Sunday morning. You can get on Facebook Live and bless some people. Uh -huh. right? If you have a gift to cook, you shouldn't be the only person benefiting off your eating, off your cooking. You're getting big as a house and the kingdom is starving. Got some selfish cooks in here. Because <laughs> anybody said amen or nothing on the team. That's messed up. Anybody, anybody said a word. Y'all just greedy. Just greedy. John 14. Jesus said this in verse 12. I tell, he's getting ready to leave the disciples. And they're, they're a little nervous because they've walked with him for three and a half years. And now and they've done miracles with him. They've seen miracles with him. And now he's getting ready to leave. And I can only imagine the trepidation and the fear. Like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do without you? Mm -hmm. Like, we good with you, right? It's almost like, it's almost like, y'all pray for the Lakers. We in trouble. Okay. Uh, it's almost like the Lakers, LeBron and Anthony Davis are injured probably for a month. And I know the rest of the players are like, we superstars with you. Mm -hmm. But now you're no longer going to be here. What are we going to do? Yeah. Could you imagine how the disciples felt? We're all stars with Jesus, because with Jesus we can trample scorpions. With, Je with Jesus we can shake off snakes. With Jesus we can do all, but now he's no longer going to be here with us physically. So Jesus says, look, hold on. First he says, my father's going to send you a comforter. Right. right? But then in verse 12, chapter 14, he says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and do the greater works. Somebody say purpose. Right. Hallelujah. Because I'm going to the Father. He says, I'm going to the Father, but trust me, what I've been assigned to do, you're going to do, you're going to be even greater at it. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, how can we be greater? Well, understand, in his three and a half years, Jesus only took the gospel so far. Mm -hmm. Y'all catch that? Okay. He said, you're going to take it across the world. Yeah. 
even somebody say even greater. Even greater. So then, then he says this. He says, you can ask for anything in my name, pretending to purpose. He says, you're going to do greater things with your purpose. Now, you can ask anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can be glory to the Father. Ask anything in my name, I'll do it. He says, look, concerning your purpose, fulfilling your assignment, whatever you ask me, I'm going to do it. Amen. Amen. This is why I don't worry about when they said it'll take a million dollars to build our homeless shelter in the back. I'm sitting at the meeting just a few days ago, and they're sitting there, yeah, it'll probably be about a million dollars. I'm sitting there like, I got it already. So y'all understand, I'm making executive decisions with four dollars in my pocket. (laughs) All I had in my pocket was a four dollar and a check card, that's all I had. And I'm sitting there, they said, yeah, it'll be a million dollars. Okay, so what if we move this over here, and you take this and pull that out here, and what if we put that, well, that might be another 250,000. Okay, well, look, what if, and I'm literally making decisions for this rendering. Because Jesus said, concerning your purpose, anything you ask, I will do. Amen. That's it. Right so I don't know where the million dollars are going to come from. I know where the 90,000 are going to come from to get to move in here either. But I know that we ask in his name. Yes. And because it was for the purpose, yes. his father had to do it. Yes. Yes. See, some of y'all walk around with an unfulfilled purpose because you refuse to ask because you're afraid you will hear no. Mm-hmm. He said, if you're asking according to your purpose, mm-hmm. ask in my name, my father. All right? Mm-hmm. Here's the fifth, fifth and final thing. Are you willing to continue to serve even though you may have to wait for it? Yeah, some of us, some of us, if God don't answer tomorrow, we throw. Y'all know we, we, we throw. Right, right, right. Are you are you willing to wait for God to do it? Yes. I'm gonna go back to the homeless vision, and I'm gonna tell you how to ask. We purchased this property, and we moved in December eighth of 2018. Or was it 19? 18. One of those years. And we were here for that full year, and we launched the homeless vision. We said, look, we have four acres of land. We're gonna give an acre back to fight this problem. We set meetings. We have land. Can we just build? It's amazing how politicians make homelessness an issue like they're concerned. But when you bring a solution to the table, some people get quiet. It's amazing how celebrities make, make homelessness a concern until it's time to do something outside. It's amazing how much money we throw at the problem without actually helping to solve the problem. And so COVID happened. We no longer had meetings. Nobody was coming outside. So we paused. I know that God said that that is your purpose. I'm going to do it, but you're going to have to wait a little while. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So two weeks ago, I get an email. Says, okay, Bishop, this is what's going on. We have, we may have money to build it. We have land. We don't have money to run a program. I said, well, let's do algebra. Right. X plus Y plus blank equals the homeless project. Mm-hmm. X is the land. Y is the money to build. And blank is we wait. Well, we got two out of three. I said we in good shape right now. Yes. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm asking according to his purpose for this ministry. I'm not asking. Are y'all catching what I'm saying? Yes. I'm not asking for it. Now, here, now, now, let me just be honest with you. I, a few years ago, I used to joke around saying I wanted a helicopter. And people would laugh. I did want a helicopter. Traffic is too bad, right? I want a helicopter, right? But I'm not asking God for a helicopter part on top of the church. Because that's not the purpose of this ministry. So if I ask outside of his purpose, he has no reason to obligate that and, and accommodate that. But I'm asking according to his purpose. I don't know who it is that's asking for things and you're frustrated because you're not getting them. Before you get mad at God, why don't you ask God, is this what you have for my life? Because you could be wasting your tears and all of your energy praying for something that's simply not for you. That's good, Bishop. That's good. Yes. Okay. Anybody mad? Because no. okay. okay. I, I want to make sure nobody's mad because if you're mad, I'm going to see your brother Sarge and he'll hug you and give you some Gatorade and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so. All right, all right so this is how you ask. This, this is the premise of the ask. 
All right, first thing is, do you really believe? You have to believe. You have to, somebody say believe. Believe. Yeah. Matthew 7 says keep on asking. Keep on knocking. Only a person who really believes that you're going to eventually do it will keep on asking and keep on knocking. Some of us still haven't received it because we got frustrated and we stopped knocking. God said, no, I need you to keep knocking because there's strength and perseverance that's built in your knock. There's deliverance in your knock in some particular cases. Because God knows if I give it to you prematurely, you're going to squander it. Ask the prodigal son. If I give it to you too early, you're going to throw it away. He says, so I'm going to need you to knock to mature yourself a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Some of us praying for husbands and wives. We're not husband and wife material. Keep knocking until you learn how to clean the house. Keep knocking until you learn how to get a job and provide for a family. Keep knocking. Right? right? I'm serious. Right? I'm serious. Right? But he said, but then Hebrews 11 and 6 says that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. If you keep knocking and you believe, and that's what I'm saying, you have to believe. When you believe, you won't quit just because you don't get it right away. When you believe, you're going to keep chasing them because you know, God, you are not a man that you can lie. Neither are you the son of man that you should repent. If you said it, you have to accomplish it. And if you haven't done it yet, that's because you need me to chase you a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah. I'm chasing after you. Come on, son. Right? And so some of us, we know that God has great things for our lives, but great things haven't manifested yet. And we allow Satan to discourage us and confuse us and make us think that we're no longer qualified for those great things. And God has said, no, you didn't do anything wrong. You just stopped knocking. So the first thing you have to believe. The second thing is you cannot harbor any grudges or ill will towards anybody. That's a tough one. Yeah. I'll keep knocking. But I ain't gonna give her. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. Watch this, watch this. Matthew 11, 20. I'm gonna read this to you in complete totality because I want y'all to see uh, what the word says. Do you know that the Bible deals with conflict resolution? Amen. Jesus teaches us in Matthew 18 how to deal with conflicts. I'm not gonna read that scripture, but I'll tell you one part says that if you got a problem with a brother, go to him. Don't go to Facebook, go to the brother. Don't go to Twitter, go to the brother. Don't go to Mother Jones, go to him. That's what the word says, right? Right? Because that's how you keep messed up, right? And we'll deal with conflict resolution later. But Matthew 11, Matthew 11, uh, verse, uh, I just zoomed in and my glasses got foggy. Okay, 25. When you stand in prayer, forgive. If you have anything against any, anyone, if you have anything against anyone, that way your Father who's in heaven will forgive you. But if you do not forgive, your Father who's in heaven will not forgive you. Right? First thing. He says that if you don't forgive, then you can't ask God for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I mess up too much not to be able to go to God. Right. Amen. I refuse to forfeit my grace because I want to hold a grudge in this earth. Second one, this is this is this is in church. Somebody say in church. In church. If you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person, then come back and offer your sacrifice to God. Wow. Okay. The first one, Matthew 18, which we'll probably go over in a couple weeks, says that if you have a problem with a brother, go to him. If you have a problem with a sister, go to him. Right? Don't go to nobody else. Go to her. Right? We typically go to somebody else first, but that's the second step. That's for another time. But this particular scripture says now the onus is not on them, it's on you. If you were in church, in worship, and you're presenting a sacrifice, what's a sacrifice? Worship. And you realize that somebody has something against you. Leave your worship. Go to that person. And try to Amen. Woo. Amen. Woo. That takes some maturity right there. Yeah. Uh, yes. But I need to get to that level because I need my mouth to be removed. It gets real quiet. Good teaching. Because that, that requires, see, it's easy, it's easy to say the first one, Matthew 18, if your brother has, if you have something with your brother, go to him. It's easy to go to somebody when they've offended you. But can you have that same oil, that same anointing, to go to somebody when you know that you've offended them? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You want your mouth removed? Yeah, that's what it's going to take. So what if so so what if God is what if God is saying this to you? 
Lord, I'm knocking. I hear you. But I'm still knocking. I see you. How come I can't get what I'm asking for? Because you know Shayla Jr. has a problem with what you did and you won't go reconcile. Amen. Number three, you can't have selfish ambition when you ask. You asking for God to do something for you should be only to impact the kingdom of God. Amen. If you're asking God to grow your business, God is saying, I hope you're asking for the kingdom. Say, if you're asking God, if I'm serious, if you're asking God for more money, God is saying, I hope you're asking for the sake of the kingdom. If, if, I'm serious. Even as it pertains to our own health, if you're asking God to heal your body, he's saying, I hope you're asking for the sake of the kingdom. Because what's the point of me healing your body if you can go out there and act a fool anyway? I'm not giving you strength to go run for the devil. I laid in the hospital bed and I prayed and said, Lord, I need you to touch my body because I have work to do for you. I didn't have selfish ambition. My ambition is all about the kingdom. Okay, watch, watch, watch. James 4. This will make these folks a little uncomfortable in their seats. We only got two more scriptures and y'all can go. Oh. Talk about me on Facebook in the third person. It's fine. Okay. In the third, in the third person. <laughs> Too much, y'all. James 4. What is, this is verse 1. What is causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires that are war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. Woo. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it from them, yet you don't have what you want because you don't even ask God for it. Oh, even God. when you ask God, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. Yeah. You only ask for what to give you pleasure. The very next yes. verse is he calls them adulterers. Yes. We yes. often just think adultery is if a woman cheats on her husband or her husband cheats on his wife. But God says you're an adulterer because you're cheating on me with your Ooh. will versus my will for your life. You're an adulterer because you're married to me and you're married to my will, but you're cheating on my will with your own selfish desires. Ooh. You, sir, ma'am, are an adulterer. Yes, yes. And you got the nerve to come and stand before me. You got the nerve to come and try to worship me and lift holy hands when you're committing adultery as soon as you leave my presence. Oh. That's good, Victor. Just say amen or out, because I've been, I've been on that. I've been there, too. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I've been there, too. Matter of fact, let's just make everybody comfortable. If you've committed adultery against the Father, just raise your hand. It's okay. Look around. Look, look. This is Adulterers Anonymous. We all been here. Because <laughs> we get to church and we act like we ain't never been there. No, the devil is alive. We've all been there. And some of us are there, and some of us may be there tomorrow. But the word says the reason you don't get what you ask for is because you're asking with the wrong motive. You're only concerned about yourself, not my kingdom, not my will for your life. Therefore, you, sir, ma'am, are an adulterer. You're cheating on me. It's right there in the word. That's why I gave it to you so you can read it for yourself. You won't say I made nothing up. All right. And so we're asking how will it impact the kingdom. Well, why in the world did it have to impact the kingdom? Why is that prerequisite? Well, let's, let's just put ourselves at work. Let's just say you work as a data processor at Eisenhower. Your job is to enter data into a computer. Right. You can go to your boss and say, I need a new mouse. My mouse is messed up. You can go to your guy and say, I need a new monitor. I can't see. I need an ergonomic keypad because my wrist, carpal tunnel and all that. What you can't go to your job for is say, I need, a, I need a Lakers jersey. Right. I need a barbecue grill. I need. No. Well, why aren't you going to give that to me when you said all I got to do is ask for it? Because it is not, it's not healthy for your job description. It doesn't fit into your, y'all hear what I'm saying? It doesn't fit into what I, what I hired you to do. And God is saying, you're frustrated because you're asking for things that don't fit into what I called you to do. And so, no, I'm going to tell you no, because your job is to seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's what the word says. So you might need to ask yourself while you're mad at God, am I asking for things that tie into my purpose? Here's the final thing. You cannot doubt when you ask. So much so that you got to walk around like you have it already. Yes. I told you I sat in that meeting with these people. They didn't know me. I didn't know them. But I knew they had money because they said so. 
They didn't know I was broke, so I didn't say a word. <laughs> I just sat there and they started throwing around numbers. So I'm like, yeah, okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. good. You know, you cross your legs and yeah, you say, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Every once in a while you pull out your iPad or your tablet, you go, <laughs> you said 450? Okay, we got you. Right, right, right. And I'm sitting there, and we didn't shake hands because of COVID, but we did this thing right here. And this basically means this. I'm like, okay, we'll see you next week. Yeah, we'll come out to the property next week. Oh, I'd love to show you around the property. And we're just talking. And I got in the car, and I just laughed. I said, they have no idea that I ain't got no money. <laughs> It was so funny. The man, the man said, "The man said we should go do lunch." I'm like, "We should." I'm like, I'm like, I was paying. Today's not, today's not the day for that. But, 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 but this, this, this is this is what I told them sitting at the table. I said, "Listen." I said, "How much is this going to cost?" They said, "It'll be about just shy of a million dollars." Why do you ask? I said, "Because the way I operate is by faith. I start to declare." that a million dollars is just coming. Yeah. I said, I stand before the people that I lead and I said, we need to petition God for a million dollars. We're not trying to build a bigger sanctuary, we're trying to house the homeless, yeah. right? See, building a bigger sanctuary, that's not our purpose. Right, right. Because we can have, we can knock <coughs> this wall out, that. that's not the purpose. The purpose is to, build, is to build something for the homeless. And so I'm sitting there, I said, I need them to know what this is going to cost. Now, when you ask for it, you can't doubt. Okay. So much so that you have to act like you have it even though it hasn't manifested itself yet. We walked the land. I walked the land a couple days ago, and I walked all the way back to that last acre. And I'm just standing back there and saying, oh, wow. Wow, this intake room show is nice. Mm -hmm. Amen. Pause it. Pause it. Yeah. Y'all yeah. not hearing what I'm saying? They said, this, they said the second acre because it's a sub basin. It, it's, if you go back there, it kind of goes low. Yeah. And he said, no, we don't have to throw that land away. That'll be a community garden where people can grow vegetables and they can have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Some of walking back there, we're going to walk through my tomato patch. That's what we're doing. James 1 and 8 says that if you ask God for it, yes. you can't doubt it. Yes. He said that kind of person is a double minded person. And a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. Yeah. It says that person should not expect anything from the Lord. James 1 and 8, write it down, read it when you get home. He says that person should not expect anything from the Lord. What is Why, why are we double-minded? Why do we doubt? Because we overanalyze things. We want it to make sense to us. And God says, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are above your thoughts. Isaiah 55. He says, you're not going to be able to figure it out, so you might as well just trust me. But we overanalyze things, and there's a saying when you play dominoes, study wrong, study long. Or study long, study long. Meaning the longer you look at it, the worse it looks like a good idea, the quicker you'll walk away from what could bless you. Some of us right now, stop believing, because we let somebody tell us it didn't make sense. Amen. Glory. Could you imagine if Abraham had let his homeboy tell him, you're not going to have a baby, y'all too old. Mm -hmm. yeah. If Sarah had let her hairdresser tell her, girl, you're 97 years old, you'll never have a child. <laughs> Could you imagine if Noah had let the man at Home Depot tell him, you don't need wood for an ark, it ain't going to never rain. Oh, Could you imagine if David let his big brother tell him, you're not strong enough to defeat Goliath. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine... All the wonderful things that we saw God do throughout Scripture would never happen yes. because they were double-minded. Yeah. Just when you thought I was talking about Noah and David and Abraham and Sarah, I'm talking about us. Yeah. Yeah. God is waiting to write the next chapter yes. for future generations to hear about. But he's waiting on us to stop being double-minded. Yeah. Just schizophrenic in our thought process. Yeah. If that's you, we want to pray today. Because the goal is to leave you out of here charged up. A, asking for what you need for, to fulfill your assignment. Amen. Knowing that because it's your purpose, he has to do it. And B, believing that he's going to do it even if it's bigger than you. I can't speak for you all, but I've had to start writing it down so I can see it. I have a little, I have a little card in my gym bag when I go to the gym and I go get my inhaler and a little pulse reader. And it just the things that I'm waiting on God to do for our purpose are written in there. So I just because when you see it and you read it, you start to speak it out of your mouth. Yes. You ever read? Yeah, right, 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 yes. right. And there's power 
of life and death in the tongue. Right. And you can literally speak things into existence. I just, I'm crazy enough to, I believe that you can speak things into existence. And so the more I speak it, the more it starts to manifest. And the more it starts to manifest, even before they put any, any steel on the ground, I'll start to see more vision take place back there. I dare you to drive by this week. And if you're not afraid of the rocks and dirt, walk all the way back, don't wear any hills, wear some, you know, and walk all the way back to the third acre and start to declare what it's going to be back there. And then when you leave here, go to your house, go to your place of business, go to wherever it is that God has positioned you to be an impact for the kingdom and start to speak that same thing over what he's called you to do. If God calls you to own a hair shop, go start looking for places. I'm serious. Stand before the place and say, I can just see my chair right there. I can see my sign right there. God calls you to own a restaurant, start looking for places. I'm not saying name it and claim it. Don't do that. You get arrested. But, <laughs> it's, it's trespassing. But, but stand before it and start to speak vision. Because you're not being selfish. You're saying, I'm going to use the gifts that God put in my hands to impact the kingdom of God. Yes. Come on, let's celebrate the world. If we know that if we're asking according to his will for our lives, why aren't we asking? One, we don't believe the word. So today we're going to pray that he helps you with your unbelief. Two, we don't think that we're worthy. So today we're going to pray that you start to see yourself the way that God sees you. And three, because somebody said. And today we're going to pray that God guards the gates of your ears for the rest of this week so you don't have to hear a negative word from anybody. Amen. Understand that people believe it can happen. They just don't believe it can happen to you. Yeah. Or they don't want it to happen to you. Yeah. One of the two. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for you letting us know that we can ask what we want according to your will, and you'll do it. God, there may be a delay, but you're going to do it. And by faith, God, we just stand here waiting in anticipation for it. God, we pray for those that have a lack of belief. Help them with their unbelief right now. Lord, link them up with other believers that can help them stand strong and remind them of the word that you're giving them. Lord, we pray for those that don't feel adequate, don't feel worthy enough. Lord, let them start to look in the mirror and see themselves as the way that you see them. You don't see them according to their failure. You see them according to their purpose. God, let them start to walk in there with their head held high, knowing that they are a daughter or a son of the king of kings. And God, for those right now that struggle with surroundings, and they said, she said, he said, Lord, we pray that you silence he and she. Amen. We pray right now that you protect the ear gates of those that are trying to get closer to you because they know they have a purpose to fulfill, but they're being pushed back by the opinions of other people. God, we pray that you silence the opinions and close off the ear gates now. Lord, let no foul word enter the spirit of those that are trying to fulfill their purpose for you. God, we love you right now because you're great. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can, I, can I help you with this before Pastor comes? I went to a funeral. I've gone to too many funerals these last two, three months. And I went to a funeral, and um, I noticed that, you know, we always talk about the dash in the middle, right? The day that you were born, dash, and the, the year that you died. Some dashes were longer than others, right? Some people 12, 13 years old. Some people 56 years old. But it's the obituary that really tells the story. And when you read someone's obituary, and they really didn't make an impact for the kingdom, all they list is their family members. When you, when you read an obituary of somebody who made an impact for the kingdom, it's a whole lot of stuff before you get to the family members. And I said in the last funeral, and I said, when it comes time for my obituary to be written, by the time they get to my family, I want y'all to be exhausted. Because I want it to be said that he did everything that God called him to do. To the point where when you look at him in the casket, he's done. He's exhausted. He's emptied out. That's just it. Y'all, let's start seeking God for the purpose he has for our lives. I promise you, life will be a whole lot easier if we walk in purpose. All right, let's celebrate God. Come on, baby. Hallelujah. What a word. What a word. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. I pray you do as well. Paul, when I was up here earlier, um, all of you all weren't here.